welcome to another episode of Sports and Discourse with your host, Derek Stevenson. And today, I got probably my best friend on earth, my brother from another mother, Matt Ellis on here with me. Matt, welcome to the show, brother. Thanks for having me, man. Glad to be here. Yes, sir, man. And today, we got to talk about this whole Shade and Sharp experiment, right? And um, the reason why I brought you on here is because I feel like... um. You know, it seems like UK has just been super divided this year, right? Probably more than ever. And it just seemed like it's just been one thing after another, right? So, you know, for everybody that don't know, right, we'll, we'll, I'll start off, we'll go over a little bit of Sharp's history, right? So I don't know if you knew us or not, but he's from Ontario, Canada. Did you know mm-hmm. that? Yes. Right. And he actually, uh, he went to three different high schools, uh, he actually wasn't really ranked in the beginning mm-hmm. of his high school career. And then he kind of right. had like a moment where he was in like uh, E, uh, what is it? The E-B-Y-L, uh, A-A-U. Correct. And then he kind of just took off after that and went like right. straight to the top. You know what I mean? And, um, you know, I haven't never really seen him play. Uh, but he seems to be from the clips. He seems to be, you know as good as advertised what do you how do you feel about him as a player yeah we don't have a whole lot to go off of just like you said we obviously didn't get to see him play any collegiately against some legitimate competition we have some little tidbits that you hear uh our our players this year talking about him I think Davion Mintz said some things about him Oscar just within the last couple days said some things about him if you just look at his clips I think the the um probably the most comparable example that I can think of that immediately came out to me was probably Malik Monk, just because he seemed to be super, super athletic. And if you remember Malik Monk's high school clips, he, I mean, his athleticism was off the charts. You know I mean? He's dunking all over everybody and, you know, alley-oops is just crazy. And that kind of looks like what the way sharp is, but the data is limited. I would even say his, his high school clips even seem more limited than, than Malik Monk or De'Aaron Fox. Like, he didn't seem like he had 15 different mixtapes like some of those kids that we've had uh, have had in the past. But um, there's also a reason that NBA folks are considering taking him with a with a draft pick. So, or, or I should say not just a draft pick, but a lottery pick, um, maybe even top 10, maybe even top five. So um, there's got to be something there. Uh, we don't have a lot of evidence to go off of, but, if, if we look at the pieces that are there, it tells us that he's probably a pretty legit basketball player. Right. Um, and that's a good comparison that you made with Malik Monk. Um, I'm not really for sure if he's as fast as Malik Monk, but he is a lot bigger. Um, yes. I don't know if he can shoot quite as good, but he looks like he got a decent stroke. Um, and, you know, I've been seeing uh, some clips of him, like, working out in the gym or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it looked like he's getting his jumper down. Um He kind of reminds me a little bit to go away from a Kentucky player. I was kind of getting the same feeling about him as I had about Anthony Edwards, right? Like a big, strong, physical guard. And I hate to say this, but like I really was hopeful that he was going to play this year because I think that he would have probably, you know, put us over the top. I hate to say it. But, um, you know, he just kind of had like a – It was just kind of a strange situation in Lexington, man. So could you uh, just kind of tell me how you felt about the whole Shade and Sharp experience while he was here? Yeah, and uh, I I think it will – I'll start back, all the way back into 2020, because you mentioned it was kind of a divided year for UK fans this year. But I think it, it was definitely a divided year, but I think it's something that's been building. And I think it all started or began around 2020, we, you know, we had a team with quickly Hagens, Maxi, Nick Richards, Montgomery, that was kind of coming in, seemed to be coming into their own. I think they had only lost five games that year. They won the SEC outright. They won the SEC or no, they didn't get to play in the SEC tournament. I don't think. Stop. Um, Stop right before. Yeah. It got got stopped. They, the last game I think they played was Florida. Um, But that team seemed to be coming into their, their, their own. Kentucky fans were getting 
excited, you know, getting like, okay, all right, we have something here. And obviously the pandemic shut everything down. And then you had last year, last year, you know, we could, we could have a whole nother episode just talking about last year and what happened, but you had that. Then you had last year, the, the worst season, you know, in, in Kentucky basketball history. And then you have this year, you know, you got a lot of transfers and stuff that came in. I think that, you know, I don't think, obviously no one expected Oscar to be what he was, I think at the beginning of the year, we knew we had a, a solid cog in the middle, you know, for us, but um, we came out playing decently. We lost some, you know, we, we, we had a few games, like when we lost to Notre Dame, we probably should have beat Notre Dame, had some of that kind of stuff. Some of the early season Cal losses that we seemed to, to, to have, but to be fair, first game of the year, we played Duke pretty well. Um, you know, we, we hung within uh, most of the game hung with them. And then they, they pulled up, you know, pulled out a little bit at the end there. Um, but then I think people started getting excited because like, okay, we're winning some games. We crushed North Carolina, uh, you know, like on, on a, went out there on that whim and destroyed North Carolina. Then it's like, okay, this team's doing some things. Oh, and by the way, the sharp kid, number one in the class role, everybody's like, man, wow, this is great, right? We, this is just going to give us more firepower. And it was just, I think the communication, there's just so much seemed mismanaged about it. And, and we could be, we could just not know all the facts. I mean, that's also possible. There's, there could be a lot of things going on behind the scenes between maybe what his camp told and what we were told or what Cal said. But I do think that there's still some blame for how it was handled all the way around. Um, then we were told ah, he's not going to play this year. And we see some points when we have trouble closing out games or putting away maybe some weaker teams. And you're just thinking, we got a, we got a lottery pick sitting over on the bench that, that could come in maybe and give us an injection. And I do think that I think sometimes people do take for granted that increase, that immediate increase in the level of competition. And I don't want to take that away from anybody. I do think that with a lot of practice around our team, he could have played. But you and I have talked about this before. We were we remember watching some videos whenever Cal first got here when all the John Wall, Bledsoe, Cousins, all those boys were out there and they were playing with Crawford and Ramel Bradley. And Crawford was destroying Bledsoe. Yeah, now, I remember that. Bledsoe, we would all take Bledsoe. Yeah, Bledsoe, we'd take Bledsoe 10 times out of 10. But there is an adjustment period, and I understand that. But then it got shut down, and then it just – the loss to St. Peter's, it just got weird, man. You know, it just it just did. I don't even know how else to say it. Yeah, it, it was kind of crazy to me. Uh, one thing that I actually – I was doing a little research, man, and I was, I was seeing something about uh, Sharp actually had a couple of NIL deals. Were you aware of that? I knew that right before he got here, he he signed with the same people that uh, got the Porsche uh, from Ty Ty. Th they got the Porsche for Ty Ty, and then I think he had a sneaker company that he, he signed did. with as well. Yeah, he did, man. Um, and that kind of makes me wonder. Um, do you think maybe they might have been scared to play him? Um, because they wasn't really necessarily sure about his eligibility. That seems to be one of the narratives that's coming out right now. Um. And that's possible because now they're saying <clears throat> that he graduated in May of 21, or maybe he graduated in October, or maybe he graduated in December. I don't think anyone really fully knows. And I think the problem and the, and the fans frustration with it is that like, and I don't expect Cal to, to give us full clarity on everything, but I think his message to the fans and the way that he portrays it back to fans gets on people's nerves because it we just want a little sliver of honesty or truth or whatever. I appreciate him at least coming out coming out and saying we're shutting him down for the rest of the year. He's not playing. At least that ended that speculation in either direction on whether he was going to play. But when when it's just like, well, as far as I know he's going to be here. As far as I know he's going to be here. Like, come on, man. You know if this, if the kid's about to go to the NBA, you, you know that there had to have been discussions there. Like he just came out. Well, I guess it was yesterday or the day before uh, Cal and was talking about, Hey, I was on his radio show and he's making it seem like I didn't really know what was going on. And then, uh, you know, Antigua tells me he's, you know, have you seen all this stuff about sharp? And I'm like, what? And it's just like, 
that's really not the way you run the program, right? Like you're the CEO of Kentucky basketball. You know everything that's going on, surely. Um, so they could have possibly known that it was an eligibility thing, and maybe that will come out in, in the future that they were concerned about his eligibility and they didn't want to forfeit those games in the event that they did, you know, make a deep run in the tournament or win a championship perhaps. Um, so yeah, I guess that's, that's, it's possible. And, and I hate to say this because I'm not trying to actually accuse anybody of anything or be disrespectful, but do you think that potentially uh, some of his handlers could have just been trying to manipulate the system? That's also possible, man. It is. Yeah. You, you, you look at, Again, we look at it. I think Kentucky fans, they're we are crazy, just like <laughs> Cal always says, you people are crazy. And there is a, he's right to a certain degree. Um, there's some uh things that have come out in the you know, if you're listening to any in some of the local sports shows or reading on some of the message boards where his is it was it his AAU coach is his mentor and is trying to become a certified agent or something like that. So <sighs> That, that looks interesting, you know, I mean, if we're being completely honest and, and not, nothing against that gentleman, if, if, uh, if he is his mentor and he wants him to be his agent, that's Sharp's choice, you know? Um, but we know that there's funny business that always goes on behind the scenes with, with these handlers, man, because you got an opportunity. It's a, it's a golden parachute. You got an opportunity to hit your wagon to uh, a young man that's going to make tens of millions, of, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars. And your little cut of that can be sizable. It could be life-changing. Absolutely. Um, one thing I, I want to ask you is, because sometimes they'll play it like, okay, we're doing what's in the best interest of Sharp. So they might think, oh, well, he's not coming along in practice like we anticipated, so we're going to hold him out. With with all the hype that's building around this kid, do you think if he would have played, do you think that there's any way possible that he could have played his way out of the first round of the draft? Or do you feel like he was a shoe in regardless? I have a hard time believing that he would play his way out of the first round unless he was just awful because they take up, they, they, they go off of, potential that's what the nba does 90 percent of the time it's why oscar is a projected second round pick and not a first round pick if you just look at oscar's stats it's like this why would he not be the number one overall pick the kid averaged more rebounds than anybody in the country and i think anybody in the last several decades and so but the nba is a business that is going to take chances on longevity and kids that have potential to be with the team and be a catalyst or, or, you know, a key team member for, you know, five, seven, 10 years, that, that lifespan is short in the NBA. Um, and, you know, it's dog eat dog, but I just, I have a hard time believing that he would have just been so terrible that he would have fallen out of the first round because we've seen instances and I can't think of one on the fly right now, but we've seen instances of kids that maybe haven't done fantastic in college that an NBA team takes a chance on and they, they work out well, you know, they become, I won't say superstars per se, but they, they become solid basketball players. You could look at BJ Boston almost to a certain degree. I mean, he, we could all agree that he didn't have a stellar year last year. And, um, but he's been in NBA games and, and done pretty decent for himself in the G league. And I think that, his best years are ahead of him. I, I do think that he'll end up being getting quality minutes in the NBA within the next couple of years. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Um, once he gets a little stronger and just a little more experience, mm -hmm. I because because he had some moments where he was putting up big numbers. Like he did. Um, he quickly was way better than I thought he would be on the next level yeah. of competition. Um, right. And and that and I want to ask you. What type of uh because you was talking about taking a chance and they may not become stars or whatever. What type of a pro do you think Sharp is going to actually become? Oh man, that's a tough. It's a tough question because the lack of the lack of evidence that we have. Um, 
I don't know. I don't know, man. It's a tough one. I if I could have seen him play maybe 10 college games, I think I could have I could have made a better educated guess. If I had to if I had to guess right now, just based on the the hype surrounding him and the little bit of footage that we've seen of him, I would say that he'll he'll be an NBA starter within a couple of years on some team. Um, his ceiling, his ceiling could be, you know, uh, uh, an NBA all-star, I think. Um, his floor could be that he goes and he kind of, you know, has a, is a role player and bounces around from team to team and has a, you know, four to seven year career on in the NBA and, you know, goes to doing whatever he does after that. Um, it's probably somewhere in the middle there and it's hard to tell because we don't have anything to go off of, but um, I expect that he'll probably make, make a little bit of noise in the NBA. Man. Um, it's just crazy to me because I feel like I've been hearing, um, you know, and I don't know if he owes this to the fans or not, but one thing that I've been hearing a lot of people have a problem with is that he's just, like even when he's making his statements and they use terms like he's testing the waters and different things like that, I think it kind of pisses fans off because they're like, bro, you're not testing the waters. Like you trying to just, dis- you trying to see if you're going to be the first pick or the 10th pick. Like, right. but either way it goes, you're not, you're not testing the waters because you're not trying to figure out if you're going to be in the lottery. You most definitely are going to be in the lottery and you're probably trying to, like, I'm going to be honest with you. If I was his handler, and this could be stupid on my part, but I probably wouldn't let him work out for anybody that's not going to have a top five pick because I'd let him work out for those teams because, you know, if you could actually sway the number one team to draft you, you would make way more money. But I think yes. after the top five, I think one of those lottery teams would take a chance on him without ever having seen anything from him. So right. me personally, I wouldn't do too much testing the waters. Like I, like I pretty much would know. Like we going forward with this, and we just gonna try to figure out where you getting placed at. Um, but I think the fact that he keeps on not really fully just saying I'm gone and it is what mm-hmm. it is is kind of frustrating the fans. Do you kind of get that sense? Yeah, it's. I think I think people felt like we're getting strung along a little bit and and I you know I I try to look at both sides of things and I appreciate the sliver of optimism do I think he's coming back no I don't I mean I think there's a 99 percent chance that he's gone and I and I think it would be foolish of him to come back if he he's going to go in the lottery he he could come back next year you know tear his ACL and never get that opportunity in his life again so I don't blame him for doing it, but I do wish to your point that he would just be like, Hey, appreciate everything. You appreciate you being in, but I'm hiring an agent and I'm out. Now we have to wait until, <clears throat> what is it? Six, one June 1st, I think for him to officially draw his name out. And I'm sure little nuggets of information are going to continue to come out. Cal said yesterday, you know, he's, well, he's still enrolled in summer classes yeah, and power classes and, his stuff's in the basement at the, uh, you know, at the lodge. And it's just like, come on, man. Like, just stop, you know, just stop. Just be like, Hey man, he's got a decision to make by June 1st and we're going to support him whether he decides to go or not. And, and then that also falls back on, on Shaden as well. Like, you know, I just, I think dude, he just wants some closure, just close the dang door and put us out of our misery on this man and let us move on and focus on our, our current roster and how we can take this net this team for next year and make them the best, you know, the best that they could possibly be. Now, what I want to ask you, and you might not have an answer for this, but going forward, like how do you prevent situations like this from happening again? Or can you? I don't know that you can. I, you know, are you going to, are you going to tell the number one high school player in America that you don't want him to come to Kentucky? that you have to, you have to pick and choose your battles. And I, it's not going to be, it's going to make Cal seat hot. If kids just start coming here and sitting on the bench and, you know, whatever this situation a couple of years ago with Jared Vanderbilt, remember it was like, he was hurt. 
but we could never really get a clear indication on if he was hurt and what was going on there. And he came back and I, I think he might've played a couple games toward the end of the year. It was just like, it felt like you may not really have been hurt and you were just kind of like, I didn't want to ruin my draft status or something, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it would make Cal's seat hot if, if that happened. Um, but at the same time, if you've got the number one player, if they're telling coach Cal, I want to come to Kentucky, and I want to play. What are you? What are you going to be like? Oh, I'm sorry, man. I I need you to, you know, write it in blood that you're going to play all, you know, all 30 games, 35 games, whatever it ends up being. And um, maybe maybe they're just like telling him that, and then they're you know they're they're making the choice to sit there. That would be a different situation. Um, but I don't think there's much you can do about it. Yeah, it it's a. It's really tough because I, I completely agree with you, right? Like you want to, because see, here's the problem with it, right? If you if you use a roster spot for a guy like this, you know, maybe the the next best shooting guard that was looking at Kentucky is not looking at Kentucky now. Mm-hmm. So you kind of like put yourself in a position where you may alienate, you know, other players that are interested in Kentucky by catering to a guy that potentially might not even play a game for you because let's let's even not even even go that high with it but say we would have got the number seven shooting guard I'm sure he would have been good enough to at least play and help us some um, right you know along with Grady and Ty Ty and Wheeler and it could have strengthened the backcourt a little bit versus you just having a player on the bench that's ultimately never going to contribute anything to Kentucky. So I think um, that's one of the issues that frustrates people um, just because when you're doing the recruiting, your spots are so limited, and I think it may cost you other players. Do you sort of uh, get that feeling too? It absolutely could. Yeah, it absolutely could. Why? I think it may have, even with the Sharp situation, that um, – it was the kid that went to Arkansas. He's a guard, um, Smith, Nick Smith, I think his name is. Yeah. He... McDonald's all American. And I remember when it was like, seemed inevitable that he was, that he was going to come to UK and the sharp situation kind of happened. Obviously we got case and, you know, we got, we got case and, and we got Livingston, whatever other, other recruits stuff coming in, but this is a top, he's a top five top five player uh you know going to going to arkansas for someone in the sec now um but again i think it goes back to i would hope that cal is asking the question is your intention to come here and just sit on the bench for a year or or use this as an example like hey man i can't do another situation like sharp if you don't want to play don't come here that's what he says that's the message that he conveys to the fans and he tells everybody you're going to come in and fight for your spot and earn it and stuff like that um, but by all means, if he, if he ended up with, a uh, the number three player in the class for next year, and then the kid gets here and says, uh, I'm just going to practice with the team and sit on the bench. I think it puts Cal in an interesting spot because like I said, his seat is going to continue to get hot if that happens. But like, do you tell the kid hey, you're off the team, man, I'm not doing that. At that point, it's too late. You're already in the season to go get another recruit anyway, but do you take that stand or do you just fight the media and the narrative on, on, you know, that person sitting on the bench or whatever? It's just, it's a lose lose situation. If, if a young man decides to do that, um, but it absolutely could affect it. And, and you, for the, you know, Kentucky by and large has recruiting slipped a, a smidge, a smidge, you know, they, they still get most of the people they want, but like that, that core group of high school kids that can make an immediate impact is not as large as a lot of people think it is. It's 20 to 25 kids out of high school in a year. And so if you start passing on a couple here, a couple there, all of a sudden you're flirting toward that outside of that cusp of immediate impact players that the, maybe the two year or the three year, you know, type players, a key on Brooks or something like that. Um, so I hope it doesn't happen like that. And um, since you brought that up, man, that was making me wonder. Do you feel like um, it's time to let this whole 
players first, one and done, um, whole little thing that Kyle does. You think it's time to just let that go and get back to just uh, trying to make the squad as good as you can for Kentucky? I think it's more so just about Cal's communication with the with the fan base. Nobody had an issue with Cal from and through 2017, essentially. Now, granted, we had the Nerlens year. You know, we went to the NIT. Um, there we had some downs, and it was people were pretty frustrated with the Julius Randle team before they made this miracle run, and that saved him a lot. But it worked like a son of a gun for years, man. I mean when you're getting Anthony Davis and John Wall and Carl Anthony Towns, Michael Kidd, Gilchrist, Malik Monk, De'Aaron Fox, Bam. Booker. Like you were getting uh, Booker. Yeah. I mean, you're getting dudes and they're coming in and making an immediate impact. It hasn't translated as well, um, you know, the last few years. Um, but I think it would more so benefit from Cal just recognizing that the fan base is frustrated. He just, I, 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 you and I, I've said this to you before, and, and I'll say it here. Cal is his own worst enemy sometimes. And he reminds me, I shouldn't say he reminds me, his communication in some ways reminds me of the situation that Trump went through. You know, Trump, I think if Trump wasn't all the time on Twitter, just, you know, calling people losers and just, you know, doing all the stuff that he did and how he communicated, he would probably be president right now, honestly. And I think Cal doesn't do, in, in some respects, Cal's similar in that he doesn't always do himself favors with his communication. Like when they ask him about an injury, I haven't seen him. You practice every day. You, you're, I'm sure there's, there's people on your staff that report to you the status of injuries every single day. Every so, single day. Every single day. So I'm, don't just I'm, like, sure, I don't know. I'm sure as a, you know, I'm sure he has meetings every single morning, right? Like in your position, you have meetings every morning, right? Yeah, of course. Same with my wife; she has meetings every day. So I know that yeah. the the like you said, the CEO, the president of Kentucky basketball, isn't just out there with nobody giving him information on his players. Like it's impossible. Absolutely, absolutely not. And so, what could he do better there? And not instead of saying, "Oh, well, I haven't seen him," and I get there's gamesmanship. You don't want to if you've got. Ty Ty is is nursing a leg injury. You don't want to you don't want to tell your opponent that he may play against in in a couple of weeks or the next game that he's a little gimpy on his right leg or something like that or that he's going to play. You know, there's some gamesmanship there, so you don't want to give everything away. But instead of being like, I haven't seen him, you could hey he's he's working out with the trainers. He's still a little up in the air for Saturday. Not 100 percent sure. Probably will be it'll probably be a game time decision or it'll probably be Friday before we can really make a call. But like, just to just be like, ah, I haven't seen him. That kind of thing I think is what, what frustrates, you know, what frustrates the kid or what is frustrating Kentucky fans right now. Yeah. Um, and it's wild. Cause now we are starting to see a whole lot of these older uh, coaches just go on and retire. Do you think that mm-hmm. this whole like NIL and portal situation is just turning a lot of these guys off and making them just walk away from the game? I think it has. I think so. It it's changed the landscape of college basketball for sure. And I, and I I actually agree with it. I mean i I never thought it was entirely fair for a coach to just be like, "Hey, I know I have a contract, but see you later. I'm taking a job for more money." But the player was bound to the school because he signed a scholarship. They're both, they're both contracts in some regard. So why should one be able to do it and one not with all that being said, it's messy. I mean, it's messy as hell, man. Um, and I can only imagine that it's more work, more stress on these coaches because it used to be like, I had my, I had my seven, eight, nine events that I'm, you know, uh, AAU events or basketball games or whatever that I'm going to attend per month or per recruiting season or whatever. And now it's like, I got to do that. I've got to be up on who is coming into the transfer portal, who may not be there. I still think an elephant in the room that we haven't addressed is, and I, I have, I'm just going to use Cal as an example. What if Cal were to reach out to, um, uh, I don't I'm just trying to go back to UCLA and secretly 
be reaching out to Johnny Juzo, you yeah. know, and this is a wild example, but my point is he is playing for UCLA and off the books behind the scenes, we're talking to a player from another team. I worry about that as well. And you're, you got a kid mid season playing for, you know, some team a division one team that's already thinking, man, as soon as this is over, I'm freaking bouncing to Kentucky or Kansas or Duke or whoever. It it's messy, and um, I can it's it it's had to increase the level of stress and responsibility uh, on the coaches to assemble the best possible rosters. So, well, it's funny that you brought that up because I've been talking a whole lot about that behind the scenes to some people. Because here's my thing, right? What I said was because like. When I did my NIL show, right, that was like a a little bit after the Texas Longhorns had just announced their uh, Horns for Hearts organization, right? Which, let's just Mm -hmm. be honest, the Texas football coach said he needed offensive linemen and then some alumni or whoever it is, they created a a nonprofit organization to get him linemen. Like, let's just be honest. (laughs) Like, they're technically not breaking the law, but let's be real. The that now there's a charity organization where the linemen come and do some charity work and they get fifty thousand dollars, right? So basically, right. that's a recruitment tool. So, what I was telling people is, Calipari need to start recruiting some of these, some of the starters from some of these other schools. Like, don't just go after the guys that's on the bench that's not getting the play that's unhappy. You need to start going to some of these power five schools and and pull a couple of starters like no, no disrespect to like Grady or anybody like that. But like I'm talking about from some of these big schools right now that you got this NIL, get him boys some money and bring Mm -hmm. them boys in. And it might even get to a point where that almost might become just as important as recruiting like high school players. Yeah. And, um, I guess what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, do you feel like uh, at some point that this might become too much for Cal as well? It's possible. I mean, it, again, look at Jay Wright, 60 years old. Cal's older than him. He's 60 and just retired and hung it up. You know, two two national championships, a hell of a coach, been at Villanova for a while and done very well there. 60 and hung it up. Coach K, you know, we – he, we were all ready for him to go. <laughs> Everyone was ready for him to get out of there. Uh, Roy Williams, same way. I don't know, man. It's very possible. I mean, we, you know, Cal said when he first came here that this was a 10-year job. Now he's got these lifetime contracts and stuff like that. I don't think he's the guy that would go as long as Coach K, though, um, or maybe even Roy Williams. If, if we I, – I don't know how many more years like this – with the heat and everything from the fan base he could really take. I think next year is going to be critically important for him. Do I think he would get fired after next year? No, that's not at all what I'm saying. But I think we, if you want to win the fan base back next year, you got to do something like it. It almost feels like final four or bust next year. If you want to win the fan base back, maybe even, maybe even more than that. Yeah, man. Um, but but that's that it I don't know, man. I, I could see if things don't trend in that direction, uh seat getting warm, coupled with this craziness of NIL deals and um, you know, getting kids that can transfer in and play immediately, him being like, Hey, I'm washing my hands of it, I'm done. Now, the one thing I will say that I think Cal why well, his actions indicate that he is very genuine about is that he does care about making the lives better of the kids that come and play for him. I give him credit for that. Um, he he does it to the detriment, I think, of Kentucky basketball in some, in some situations because I think it's more about preparing them for the next level than it is sometimes winning a championship. But with that respect, he has an opportunity to see kids get NIL deals and maybe lift themselves out of poverty in a way that they wouldn't be able to without – without a deal like that, or, you know, or perhaps being able to get to the, uh, to the NBA. So, you know, I, I don't know, man, it's, it's possible. It's going to put more stress on all these coaches for sure. And it, 
could be handled maybe with some additional hires on your coaching staff or, you know, within the organization that could kind of help to offset that burden a little bit. But um, I would expect him to be here for a while still. I don't think he's going anywhere. Um, but I also wouldn't be overly shocked if he's just like, hey, man, I'm retiring. I mean, look at what, look at what Jay Wright just did. Yeah, man, that was crazy to me. And um, I know we got a little off track a little bit, but I want to bring it back to Sharp too. Um, is, do you think there's anything that Cal could have did to try to actually figure out on his own about this kid's eligibility? Or, like, whose responsibility is it to figure all of that stuff out? Well, we have a compliance department, um, and we've had our situations. I think, uh, what was it, back in the tubby days with Randolph Morris, whenever there was a fax that was lost or something uh, in yeah, our I compliance remember. department. <laughs> I remember um, you know, we, we have, we have our own compliance department that is responsible to ensure that they're eligible to play college basketball, but you can only, you can only be so good as the information that you're given. Right. So uh, if, if they're given a diploma that is, is all, or a transcript or something that is altered and I'm not, and I'm not saying that for sharp at all. I'm not, I'm not making that accusation. I'm just saying, they have to go with what they're given. And if they're given misleading information or they're not giving, not given clear information or, you know, they're a piece or whatever, that, that could, that could certainly affect it. And, and maybe that could be a, a, ca- a reason for Cal to, to say, Hey man, we don't have all our facts on if you're truly eligible or not. So we're just not going to play you possibly could be an outcome. Yes, sir, man. Well, I ain't going to hold you too much longer, but um, before we go, man, I want you to just tell me for next year, how do you feel about the team the way it is as of now? And how would you feel about it if Sharp actually, that 1% chance that he comes back, he <laughs> actually did? Um, I, I, feel, I feel pretty good about the team next year. Okay, so without Sharp, I still feel pretty good about the team. You have – the national player, the consensus national player of the year returning. That's never a bad thing. We know that we have a we have our our front court decently shored up because some combination of him and Ware and Brooks and Toppin, we got Livingston coming in. Some combination of those those guys will be able to handle the front court for us. Um, as far as the back court, I think considering Wheeler comes back, which I think seems to be likely you got a, you got a point guard that is proven. And I know some people were frustrated with some of the things with Wheeler. I, you know, I don't, you're going to turn the ball over as a point guard because you have the ball in your hand the majority of the time. That's just what happens with the point guard. But, but for the most part, he, he, he did, he did very well for us. He was solid. Him and Ty yeah, Ty was, was both pretty solid. And then when they started having the injuries, things got a little funny for him, but I mean, he's not a, he's a solid point guard. Yeah. And you've got, uh, as far as your front court, so you got Wheeler, you've got uh, the Wallace kid coming in, who's looked pretty solid. Um, CJ Frederick, we get back off of, you know, from his injury. um, That is probably, I mean, I would say comparable in in shooting ability to Grady. So that's a good thing. And Collins is coming back too. Uh, Oh yeah. I forgot about Collins. Yeah, exactly. Forgot, forgot about Collins. I think they'll, I think they'll still add, Maybe that the kid out of Illinois State or whatever, Reeves is his name, I believe, that averaged, you know, 20 a game or something up at Illinois State. So I think that without Sharp, I still think they're solid. And there'll probably be some additional pieces that they'll still add out of the transfer portal. Maybe another high school kid, you know, like they did with Ty Ty last year, kind of late in the year. Um, if Sharp comes back, they, I think they'll be a problem. Uh, if we If we believe the hype, and who he is and how good he is him with Wheeler and Wallace and Livingston and all those kids, Oscar, obviously, I believe if they would probably be the number one team in the preseason, if I had to guess. Um, And if we believe the hype, they would be, they would be a tough out. That would be a real tough out. I'm not getting optimistic about that, but we can dream. Yeah, man, Oscar. I was listening to a little bit of Oscar's presser, and uh, 
He said managers didn't sit right with him going out to St. Peter's, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, and man, honestly, uh, you know, it's kind of an unfortunate situation for guys like Oscar because, like how we were talking earlier, you can be a guy that can be on a team, you can literally put the team on your back, carry them all year long, become the national player of the year, and they won't consider you a first round draft choice. And the same team, you can have a guy that does not play one single <laughs> minute and probably going to be drafted in the top five, man. Ain't that crazy how basketball is nowadays? That's such as life in basketball, man. That's the way it is. Yeah, man. But, um, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing Oscar get back. He said that, um, you know, he just didn't really want to test the waters. He said he didn't want – um to deal with uh, people telling him uh, how he wasn't good enough and this and that, and he's just going to work on his game. And he's just set out and determined to prove it. And, you know, he said that uh, he thinks that if, if Sharp comes back, they'll be next level, but he kind of feels mm -hmm. the same way you do, that he likes his chances, and he's not going to let St. Peter's do that to him again. He's made the promise. So we'll see, man, and, um, you know, hopefully uh, they can get back to looking like UK basketball, man, because these last couple of years, it's been kind of tough, man. Um, yeah. It's even kind of, I hate to say this, but because you, you know, I, you know how I used to defend Cal, man. And and it's, it's just getting harder and harder for me, man. Like I'm, I'm having to just lay back and uh, let people say how they feel. And, and I'm just kind of like, well, I can't really argue against you right now, but um, it just kind of seems like the other, uh, you know, the Blue Blood schools are having a little more success than Kentucky has lately, especially with Kansas winning this championship. You know, yep. UCLA went to the Final Four last year. Um, and it's just kind of starting to bother me a lot, man. And I think um, it's time for Kentucky to step back into their rightful place as number one. And um, hopefully with or with Sharp, we'll do it next year. I, I hope so, man. And I'm you and I are on the you and I are similar in our our views of Cal. I've I've also been a, a staunch supporter of him and and what he did, what he has done at the program. I think that who are you going to get right now? You know, if you're if you were to let Cal go, replace Cal. Um, but uh, it that that being said, I'd be lying if I if I said that I wasn't disappointed in the way things have progressed the last several years, you know, we had a elite eight game against Auburn with PJ's team and hero that we should have won. And we should have been in the final four that year. If we go to the final four that year, I'm not sure we're having as difficult of some conversations as we're having right now. If 2020 doesn't get cut short and we make a run, then we're not having this conversation, you know, but we had a little, we had a bad string there. Uh, and, and so um, I'm anxious to get it back and get it back right and start making some noise again and become that hit school again, you know, that, that all the kids want to attend and uh, play for and take that, get some more rings. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, there you have it, man. Listen, I appreciate you coming on the show, brother. And, uh, you know, I'll definitely see you tomorrow for nephew's birthday, man. But anyways, tell everybody I said, what up? And I'll see him. And, uh, Thank you guys for tuning in, you know, as y'all always do. And we'll get back at it next time on Sports and Discourse with Derek Stevenson.